happy you're here with us this morning. Make sure you log on to covechurch.live. It's a great way to watch our sermons online. And before you leave today, make sure you download our app to share our content with friends and family. Many of you might know that I like to bake. In fact, my youngest son is a pastry chef by trade. So I guess you could say that baking and providing delicious carbs for others is kind of our love language. In a way, spiritual gifts are like cooking. When you make a dish, you use a variety of ingredients in different amounts, and they all work together. But without the proper ingredients or correct amounts, your meal is gonna suffer. A little bit of salt can enhance an entire dish, but if you add too much, then you got seawater. It's the same thing with spiritual gifts. Without the variety and right amounts of people's spiritual gifts working together, the local church is gonna lack something. We all have been given spiritual gifts and are called to use them in service. How can you use your gifts to impact those around you? Well, our worship team is gonna be out in just a moment, so get ready to enjoy a time of worship and the next message in our Activate Sermon series about the role of spiritual gifts in the church. everybody. Welcome to Cove Church. We're so grateful that you're here to worship God with us, and we are going to have a great time uh, today. We have a mission team up on the stage right now. Next weekend, we are sending them to Mountaintop to serve in the Cumberland Plateau area, and we want to send them out and commission them this morning. Would you join us as we do that? Uh, good morning, everybody. We're in our Activate series right now, and, uh, and, and these fine folks here are answering the call to activate their faith in a very particular way uh, by going on an adventure together um, in, in Mountaintop in Tennessee uh, to serve God uh, using their gifts uh, to help others to demonstrate his love. So would you do this kind of our virtual laying on of hands, Cove Church style, and just reach out a hand in front of you if you don't mind as we pray them out today. Uh, Lord Jesus, we thank you for your love for us, and we thank you that because you first loved us, that we can love one another and, and love others. And Lord, right now, as these uh, folks, these families go out on mission, uh, we pray that, they, that you would go uh, before them um, and, and be their rear guard and also every step of the way with them. Uh, may they walk in your spirit, and may they be uh, safe and protected uh, from harm, uh, but may they also just be your hands and feet as they serve and as they love those that they come across in your name. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless y'all. Go team. Like prisons that we couldn't escape, but he came. 
thank you for every time you've been there for us. I know that there are some in, who are still seeking you and maybe even seeking you uh, with great faith. As we come to you this morning, as we turn our eyes to you, would you help us to see that you are right here? Help us to hear your word, to know you and to know who we are as your children, that we would be able to surrender um, what we came here with in order to carry your burdens, which are light, and to know the truth of who you are and what you've called us to here in this life. Help us to know that truth. Amen. You can be seated. Thank you so much for singing with us. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Cove Church. We also want to give a special hello to our online family. Whether you are new or you're a familiar face, we are so glad that you're here. We really do feel that God put you here for a reason, and we're excited to connect with you. This is really important today. If you are in one of the outside seats, there's a basket of pens on the floor. We want to make sure that everyone has a pen in hand today, so please grab that pass basket. If you're close to one, um, pass it down to your neighbor, and everyone make sure to have a pen today. We've got three cards in our chairs this morning. I'm going to walk you through two of those. Your connection card is really helpful if you're new or you're wanting to get involved and engaged in Cove Church. John sends out an email every Friday. You can sign up to receive that. You can also learn about things more like membership um, and baptism. You can just look at the various options on there. You can hang on to this and put it in the connect boxes at the back of the worship center or in the lobby when you leave, or you can place it in the black offering buckets when they come around in just a few minutes. You also have a card for prayer in your chair. This is very intentional for our church. These are poured over every single week intentionally, thoughtfully. We want to support you. We care about you. Um, so please let us know how we can help you or someone who is important in your life. You can fill that out and put it in the connect boxes, or you can also um, pray, have one of our prayer partners later in the service um, pray over your particular request. So we encourage you to do that if you feel comfortable doing that. Today is Discover Cove. So whether you are new or you have been here for a while and you have questions, you'd like to know more about our church, this could be a great event for you. It's at noon. It's in the lobby right out here outside the worship center. Lunch and childcare are provided. This is a place where you can meet more of our staff. You learn more about our values, our beliefs, our mission, more about opportunities to serve and get involved and of course you can have any of your questions answered so don't worry if you haven't gotten a chance to sign up yet we have plenty of room and would love to have you it is now time where we prepare our hearts for the offering and we do want to acknowledge the power that your giving does have um, it is a ripple effect it goes beyond all of us but it also connects us to the greater good and that is kingdom impact which is so important so your difference uh, your giving does go a really long way. There are three easy ways you can give through the Cove Church app, through our website, or here in person. So if you're on the left side of the chairs, please pass those black buckets that are on the floor down your particular row and then just set it down on the ground when it gets to the end. Thank you guys so much for worshiping with us. We're so glad to have you today. Good morning, my name is Louis Canaday and I am the director of Kids Cove, which is our children's ministry here at Cove Church. Um, I, I noticed last week when Rika challenged us to read um, 1 Corinthians 12 through 14 and to pray through that, when I did it, there were some things that really stood out to me. And I'm going to read you the, the, um, from chapter 12, verse 7. Now to each one, the gifts of the Spirit are given for the common good. And, and as I read that and the rest of those chapters, I began to, to think about the interplay between our natural talents and between the indwelling of the Spirit and the gifts that he gives us so that we can do the tasks of his kingdom in a way that we never could in our own strength and our own power. And so as I thought about that and prayed about that this week, um, I wanted to explore with you um, where do you fit in all of that? What is the interplay between your natural talents 
and between the gifts that God can give you to use in his service. And I have a story that might help you if, you're, if you have questions about how that all works. So here's my story. We're having a party. Well, one of us is having a party, and the rest of us are all coming. So I want you to ask yourself the question as I tell this story, who am I at the party? So maybe you're the one who's having the party. Maybe you're the host or the hostess. And if, if that was me, I would need to go home right now and clean up. But nobody gets to leave because this is just hypothetical. All right? So maybe you're the host or the hostess of the party. And when we all get there, you're welcoming us in. You're watching the whole time. And you're making sure that all the guests have what they need. If you see somebody who maybe needs something else from the buffet, maybe you bring it to them. Or if you see somebody that's in the corner by themselves, maybe you introduce them to a new friend. Your attention makes everything at this party run smoothly and well. If that's you, then maybe one of the opportunities for service that you might hear, have here at Cove Church is to be a Kids Cove Safety. You'd be a natural. You do, at a party, exactly what safeties do. Our safeties are in the doorway. They're welcoming kids in. They're making sure small group leaders have exactly what they need as far as supplies go. And they're paying attention to what each child needs. A friend, a little extra t attention, a little extra structure. And they're providing that so that everything runs like clockwork. But it doesn't have to be in Kids Cove. Maybe you could issue that warm greeting right out here at our front doors as people come in to the service on Sunday mornings. Maybe you're not the host of the party, though. After you've invited me into the party, or after the host has invited me into the party, I look around, and the first person I see is somebody who's got a group gathered around them, and they're holding court in the best possible way. They're sharing an idea that they're really passionate about. Or they're telling a story from their day, and even if they're just telling about how they went to the bank, they're making it engaging and funny. If that's you, you're a storyteller. You could make God's word come alive from the stage in Kids Cove. Or you could energize a group of adults in our ESOL ministry. Maybe that's not you, though. Maybe you're the one I see on the couch over there with just a couple of people around you. And you're talking to them. Y'all are sharing ideas. You're asking them questions. You want to know them better because you are all about the people. You're a small group leader all day long. You can develop relationships. You can build community in Kids Cove and student ministries or even as a facilitator of an adult C group. All right, maybe that's not you on the couch. Where are you then? Ah, maybe that's you in the back back there, tinkering around with the host's wireless speaker system, making the music come out of it. And if that's you, I need you to come to my house because I can never make those things work. But even more importantly, Kids Cove, Student Ministries, and Worship Ministries wants you to know you're a tech volunteer. And we can absolutely use your gifts and your talents to serve God here in Cove Church. Okay, not with the wireless speakers? All right, where are you? Okay, maybe you're the one on the karaoke machine. Or maybe you're the one back in the back with the host's neglected guitar and you've tuned it up and you're playing a song. You can join in, in serving God in worship, anywhere from our preschool stage all the way up to the stage that I'm standing on. If that's not you, if that absolutely terrifies you, if your voice is kind of like mine and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't, then maybe I can find you somewhere else at this party. No, I, I don't see you anywhere. I bet I know why. I bet you're in the kitchen doing all the behind-the-scenes work that makes the party great. And if that's you, Cove Church has a ton of opportunities where you can stay out of the spotlight the way that you like to, but you can do important work that makes everything we do possible. 
Maybe you're a Kids Cove prep volunteer. Maybe you could come during the week on your own time and you could gather together all of the supplies that our large group and our small group volunteers need when they interact with kids. Or maybe you could serve behind the scenes by by going to student ministries on a Sunday night and you could be you could serve a student who's had a really rough week a slice of pizza and a smile that could make a huge difference in how his or her week goes or maybe you could be right out there serving all of us coffee and donuts and getting us ready to go for the worship service. There are a lot of ways that you can serve behind the scenes if that's your thing. So I want us to think, a party's not a party without all those guests there. And when I look in Corinthians 12, it tells me that the church is not the church unless each one of us activates our gifts and uses our natural talents in the service of each other within this building and in the service of the the wider community outside of it. That interplay between your natural talents and and the, the Spirit's giftings, that's a little hard to explain. It's kind of a mystery, but it's easy to experience. And here's how you experience that. You take on a task that stretches you a little bit, that's just a little bit more than maybe you feel comfortable doing in your own strength. I won't tell you that Kids Cove doesn't need volunteers. We do. If you wander down our hallway, you'll see that we have our big board up. And the big board has about mm, 160 slots on it for people who could volunteer. And every other ministry in this church will tell you the same thing. We do need volunteers to do what we do here at Cove Church and outside in the community. But Cove Church is not about putting warm bodies in a slot. What we are about is you trying something that takes maybe just a little bit more than you've got on your own and finding out that the Holy Spirit will meet you in that and that he will gift you with what you need to do not just to get by, but to do a job that has an impact in your church and in your community. And so that's what we're offering is kind of a slot in our lab. We do, we're doing a science experiment here. And the experiment is, how does it work for you, that interplay between your natural talents and the Holy Spirit's gifting? The only way for you to find out is to try it. So here's what I want you to do right now. Pick up the Activate card. That's the one that Jeannie didn't tell you about. So go ahead and pick that one up for me. And your pen that got passed earlier. And if you know who you were at the party, I want you to write that on the top, on the side, on the bottom, anywhere. Um, You don't have to remember what it's called. You can just say, I'm holding court. Or, Miss Louie, I can handle your speaker system. Or, you know, I'm on the couch. It's all about the people. I'm in the kitchen. Just tell tell me who you are at the party. And you can use that a little bit later on. When John Tanner gets up here, You're going to need to interact with that card, so keep it in your hands. And and join me in praying for, for God's indwelling, for God's power to be in us. Dear Lord, we come before you today just grateful that part of the love that you show for us is that you send your spirit to do the things that we cannot do, to lead us in the way that we should go. As John brings the word this morning, Lord, open our eyes and our ears and our hearts to both your word and your guidance. In Jesus' name, amen.
Good morning, Co. family. Uh, so glad to see you this morning. And those of you who are worshiping with us online, we're so glad that you're with us as we continue our Activate series. Uh, last week, uh, Rika uh, got us kicked off uh, talking about this idea of convergence. Uh, convergence was this concept inspired by the book by that name by Canadian pastor and theologian John Thompson. Uh, talk about how spiritual practices or disciplines, spiritual gifts, and spiritual experiences, when those three things come together, uh, the, the combination of those things and the overlap of those realities in our lives are the catalyst for a life that makes an impact for the kingdom of God. And when collaboratively we all experience those things together, uh, then we are a church of impact uh, that is uh, making a difference in the world in significant ways. And so uh, thinking about, we've talked a lot about spiritual practices lately in our church, and uh, we've been uh, doing a lot of, of work on how to abide in Christ and how to experience the, uh, the life that is truly life and the abundant living uh, through staying connected to Christ um, on, a, on a daily basis. Um, in this series, we're talking about how to put that into practice and how to live out our faith uh, that we have developed in him in order to demonstrate his love, both in this place and to our community and the world. And today, we're going to take a closer look into this idea of spiritual gifts. And so if you have a Bible with you today, I want to invite you to turn or the app on your phone, uh, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 12. Paul's letter to the church at Corinth, uh, chapter 12. And we begin with what is somewhat of a theme verse for this entire series um, in verse 1, where Paul said, Now about the gifts of the Spirit, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. And that is the spirit in which we offer up this teaching this month, in this month of April, this Activate series, is about this idea of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. We do not want you, our co-church family. We don't want you as those who walk through these doors or those who are joining us online. We do not want you to be uninformed. Uh, we, we want you to become aware of, if you never really thought much about this, or if you have, uh, to really re-engage this idea. What does it mean uh, to, as we walk in the Spirit and as we grow in Him, what does it mean to discover and deploy the spiritual gifts that God has given us. And so then we're going to pick up with verse 4 and, um, and read uh, the remainder of our text this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, beginning with verse 4. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God at work. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one, there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom. To another, a message of knowledge by the means of the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by that one Spirit. To another, miraculous powers. To another, prophecy. To another, distinguishing between spirits. To another, speaking in different kinds of tongues, and still another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of the one and same Spirit, and he distributes them to each one, just as he determines. So the eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable, we are treated with special modesty. While our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it. So that there should be no division in the body. But that its parts should have equal concern for each other. 
If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. And God has placed in the church first, First of all, apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, the gifts of healing, of helping, of guidance, and of different kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? No. Now, e eagerly desire the greater gifts. May God have his blessing to the reading of his word. And so it's important for us at the outset to understand the problem that Paul is addressing here. This is his first letter to uh, the church at, at Corinth. And this, was, this city of Corinth was uh, a, a wealthy, uh, very prosperous, bustling urban center um, in the midst of uh, this uh, Roman, Greco-Roman culture of the day, and this minority little upstart movement of this church plant that, that Paul had established there um, is growing rapidly. And they are in this place of kind of a division over, apparently, over this issue of, of giftedness. And so they uh, particularly have a lot of expressiveness in and around some of, of what are the more um, dramatic gifts, if you will. You know, gifts like glossolalia in the Greek, which is the speaking of an unknown tongue uh, as a part of their worship experience. And some of these more ecstatic type gifts and gifts of healing and miracles and those types of things. And so as Paul addresses the issue of spiritual gifts, uh, part of what he's addressing is this disunity or this thing that was kind of part of the cultural experience there in Corinth, which is kind of a pecking order, that there is a hierarchy of, of like, and, and it's part of their cultural experience, but now it's, being, it's in the church. And in the church, they have this kind of a comparison syndrome going on uh, where some are considering themselves better than others, and others are considering themselves lesser than compared to those that are kind of the giants, you know, the spiritual superstars. So they had like five-star Christians, four-star, three-star, two-star, one-star. And in this kind of hierarchy, Paul is just kind of throwing a, a stick of dynamite and blowing that up and saying there is no part of the body of Christ that is more or less important in God's eyes and it is important for you to understand what it means to be a part of a team, right? That you're a part of something that is bigger than, than the individuals. It's bigger than the sum of the individual parts. And, and, and Paul, the whole entire letter is all about that. And so we get this reason why 1 Corinthians 12 and 1 Corinthians 14, what is in the middle of those two, those two chapters about spiritual gifts? Chapter 12, spiritual gifts. Chapter 14, spiritual gifts. Chapter 13, anybody know what chapter 13 is about? The love chapter, right? And we have the love chapter that is so often, I've done it many, many times more than I would like you know, to count how often that I've read from 1 Corinthians 13 as I've officiated you know, weddings throughout my entire ministry career for so, so many times so long. And that that is, you know, it is an application of it, and I think it's a, it's a good application of it, but it's not the original context, right? 1 Corinthians 13 is not about marriage, first and foremost. It's about community. It's life in community. It's life in the church and how we are called to love one another. Love is patient. Love is kind. All those things operating in the body of Christ. And so the Apostle Paul here is reminding us that we are one body, that we are one team. And just to kind of a side note here, it's interesting. As far as I know, I've seen this written. I, ha I can't really prove it. Uh, but as far as I know, I believe that it's true. This is the first time that the word, what is translated later in the King James English member, that is used for anything other than a body part, right? 
And so this idea of the body as a metaphor for an organization or an organism that is applied here to the church, this is the first time it's used. So anytime we see something like uh, the, word, the use of the word member, whether you're a member of a club or a member of, of, of an organization or a church or a team, you say, well, I'm a member of this or that. You're really, whether you realize it or not, uh, you are connecting back to this metaphor that is given from Paul here in 1 Corinthians 12. And so think about how far the idea of membership and membership has its privileges. And hey, I'm a member here at this club or whatever. How far that has drifted from what its original intent really is. And what I want us to do today as we talk about spiritual gifts is understand that the context here is that Paul is helping them understand, hey, you're, you're all members. You're all different parts of something that is a part of a greater whole. And when we lose sight of that, uh, then yeah, that's when the backbiting and the comparison syndrome and the conflicts and all the disunity, that type of thing is inevitable, just like it is on any work team that you're a part of or any athletic team that you are part of or that you've seen, is that when, as soon as we start you know, thinking about me, myself, and I, then we lose sight of the greater whole and the greater good that we're all called to be a part of. But within that context, I do want us to see in that diversity of gifts within the unity of the body of Christ uh, what it means to discover our spiritual gifts and activate them as a part of the greater body of Christ this morning. Someone said uh, many years ago that football, um, now that March Madness is over, we can start preparing for football season, right? Football is 22 people on a field badly in need of rest and 40,000 people in the stands badly in need of exercise. <laughs> and so one of the things that, that Paul will say here is this is not just about a few stars. This is about all of us uh, being not spectators or not lesser than uh, than the persons that might be more visible within the body of Christ, but that we are all part of something, that we're doing something together. Um, anybody heard of the Pareto Principle? You know what the Pareto Principle is? The Pareto Principle is like the 80-20 rule. And it, in this idea, there's a certain, I'll admit, inevitability about it in, any, in nature, even in some ways, but in, in organizational kind of sociological realities is that the 80-20 rule is that like 20% of the people do 80% of the work. 20% of the people in the church context, so typically, 20% of the people uh, do 80% of the giving in a local church. The Pareto principle is pretty predictable. I mean, it, it does play out quite commonly. But can I just name this? It's not God's plan for his church. It's not biblical. It's not, it's not God's best for us to operate according to the 80-20 rule. God desires us all, not just so we can get stuff done, but so we can actually be his body. He, his desires for every single person who uh, is called by the name of Jesus, who is a follower of Christ who has the, the, the deposit of the Holy Spirit in them as a believer be activated and involved uh, through a local church, our local church or otherwise, and also w beyond the local church in our communities and in the world. And I just, I just want us to think about what, how we all, our church and most churches, we fall short of that, don't we? We fall short of that ideal and there's a gap. And that gap is, is where the opportunity for growth and transformation and change exists organizationally or, or, or individually, corporately or individually. And I want us to, to really just imagine what that might look like. Because what's without you activating the gifts that God has given you, 
without you discovering and deploying those gifts for the glory of God and for the benefit of the common good of his body and his church and of, his, and of our, uh, our community, then we're really kind of uh, operating not, not at full strength. Um, I'm a big golf fan. My favorite probably sports event in, of any sports event is the Masters. My wife is in Charlotte, North Carolina with our grandson right now because my grandson's father, my son-in-law, and his dad are at the Masters, and I'm very jealous. I'm jealous of them. I'm jealous of my wife. I'm jealous of everybody right now. So they're all doing great, really great stuff. But I'm glad to be where I am, and I'm, you know, I found myself in, in Louis' story, and as she's telling that story, I thought, yep, I think I'm doing the right thing right now. Just up here telling stories. And so... But I'm glad to be here, I really am. But I love the Masters, it's, it's my favorite sports event. And I, I really got, an, I got so inspired after day one that just against all odds that Tiger Woods was playing good golf uh, despite every potential barrier on Thursday and Friday and then made the cut and broke the record for that. And then yesterday, so I'm just kind of watching it on my computer yesterday as he began his his round and he started off okay and then he began to falter and he faltered and shot an 82 which by the way is still good because even though that sounds terrible for someone of the greatest golfer of all time uh, by by some accounts he's certainly one of the two or three and you know 82 is horrible by his standards but I don't know many people that could go out, uh, Spike, even maybe now at your age, could you go out and shoot an 82 at, at that, at, with that tee box on that? Maybe. But you're the only person I know that could. So very few people could go out and shoot that score. But for him, by his standards, it's terrible. So why did he shoot an 82? It's because his body is failing him after all of his surgeries and his accident and all these things. And so he's trying to play the rigorous challenge of the master's course on a leg and a half. He doesn't have the full use of all the parts of his body that are necessary for him to function to his fullest potential of what he once did. And so just think about that as metaphor for just a moment. What we are versus what we could be as a church, if we are functioning not with a leg and a half, but we are fully functioning as we each activate our part of the body, then we can fulfill uh, the best of what God uh, has in mind for us. And that's really what this Activate series is all about, is imagining what that would look like. But there are barriers, let's just be honest, there are barriers to that. You might call them excuses, uh, but for some they're kind of real, some are perceived barriers, and some are just excuses that we have, like Moses had excuses, all kinds of excuses, you know, as to why he might not be the one to answer God's call in his life. I don't feel qualified. And just realizing that God, you know, doesn't call the qualified. You know, as, as the old cliche goes, he qualifies the called. But it's true. I don't, I don't have time, which is a matter of priorities. I'm afraid. I have fears. Uh, maybe there's apathy. Maybe there's a certain consumerism that's such a part of our culture, it's a part of the church. We go in order to what we get out of it rather than what we give. For some, there's burnout, or maybe you've been burned, or maybe you're just tired. There's all kinds of reasons. But what I believe is, is that strategic gifts-based service, and not just filling slots, is that when we do that, we can be both fruitful and fulfilled in that. We can make the most difference when we discover our gifts and serve according to our gifts in a way that is properly boundaried, in the right rhythm, in the right in the right pace, that we can do so in a way that will be not only fruitful and impactful, but also very fulfilling, full of joy 
in that kind of service. And that's when we really discover our gifts and serve according to that. So very quickly now, I want to go through some just basics about this idea of spiritual gifts. What are spiritual gifts? One definition, it's a very simple definition I like, it's just this, it's special abilities that God has given you to share his love and serve others. Special abilities that God has given you and to, uh, to share his love and serve others. And it's different than natural abilities or talents, though it can be related to them, but not always. Uh, as we circled up to pray this morning as a worship team and all the different, in our little circle of prayer, there's all these different gifts, all the kinds of things that Louie was talking about in her party example were, were, were right there in our circle as we prayed. And we reflected on that, that some of, you know, some of us use natural gifts that God has given us, but then the Holy Spirit comes alongside and, 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 and magnifies that giftedness so that that giftedness is, is glorifying God and, and ministering to people. And you, so you can play an instrument or, or sing a song, and it's not just a, it's not just a performance. It's, a, it's an act of worship. And the difference there is consecration. It's the commitment that we make and that we, are, we come broken and humble and say, God, use me. Use me in order to glorify yourself, in order to, to communicate your, your love. And, and as we do that, then we take maybe a natural ability, but it is also done in a way that is spiritual. But sometimes the spiritual gifts are just completely different um, and, 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 and even in some ways counter you know, to our natural giftedness. Some of the people I know uh, that are most gifted, for instance, in the area of evangelism, that they've been given a gift of evangelism, uh, that people tend to just res- they have a way of leading people into a personal relationship with Christ, are by nature shy. They, they're not like salesman type personalities, but yet God has given them this spiritual gift that is this supernatural. And I think God loves to do that. God loves to surprise us, right? He loves to, to give us something. Like, that has to be God. And I could give many examples of that, but just, that has to be God because it's certainly not me. And so this idea of spiritual gifts is different than natural, natural abilities or talents. It's also different than acquired gifts, a gift, something that we develop over time. Uh, any of us, if we put our minds to it, there's certain things that we uh, can't do that then we can do, you know, whether that's play an instrument again or whatever. There are, but this is, this is something beyond that. This is something different than that. And in, in the book, um, Act uh, Convergence by John Thompson. He re- references Robert Clinton and the kind of categories uh, that he gives three buckets or three kind of categories of spiritual gifts, love gifts, power gifts, and word gifts. And, uh, you know, we don't have time to go into a deep dive into all the different gifts uh, that are listed in the scriptures, um, but they're through uh, different uh, verses, you know, different chapters like 1 Corinthians 12, Romans and 14, Romans 12, 1 Peter 4. Um, some use some of the Ephesians verses uh, that could be considered gifts or roles. Uh, but there's a lot of different places in the, in the New Testament where the spiritual gifts are kind of listed. Now, I don't think those lists are necessarily exhaustive. Uh, but in and there, there's overlap, you know, between them. We can make, you know, you can make a list and you can take an inventory and all those kinds of things, and those tools can be helpful. Uh, but I think it's more helpful to, for us to really uh, consider how is it that we operate and put ourselves in a position where we can discover, okay, how can God use me? And in what ways can God use me? Um, and I think these categories are helpful for us to think about. Love gifts. Love gifts manifest the love of God in practical ways. Love gifts manifest the love of God in practical ways. Um, Underneath love gifts, uh, what uh, uh, J. Robert Clinton uh, puts under those is administration, helps, mercy, and giving are some of the examples that might be considered love gifts. And that is that those are are the persons that, uh, as in Louis' example this morning, 
are, are usually uh, behind the scenes and, and helping, you know, helping things function so that others can then use their gifts for the glory of God. Uh, the second category um, is word gifts. Word gifts clarify the nature, action, and purposes of God. Again, in Louis' example, those are the, those are the ones that are either uh, holding court, you know, um, that are uh, telling stories in the party, or, or maybe they're connecting with a few in, in crucial conversations, you know, on the, on the sofa in the corner. Uh, the, the word gifts uh, underneath that category in the scriptures are teaching, encouragement, apostleship, leadership, shepherding, evangelism. Uh, all those are examples of how God gifts some people to use words um, in order to speak God's truth. Whether that is something like what I'm doing right now or something like just a word of encouragement uh, that God has placed on your heart uh, for one person to one individual. Have you ever had that happen? You know, if, if, if you've, it's one of the coolest things in the world, the exciting adventure of just like when, you, when someone gives you a word and you're like, how did they know? How, how did they possibly know that that was the right word at the right time, a timely I have some people in my life that do that on, a, on an occasional basis to where I'm like, there's no doubt in my mind that that's a spiritual gift because they just happen to have the right word of encouragement at just the right time on a regular basis and that God uses the, that in order to make the body of Christ uh, whole and function well as each use their gifts. And then the final category is power gifts, and that's Kind of in Paul's teaching, he's what he's he's reminding them that the spiritual gifts are not just all about the power gifts. And so, in a way, the whole thing he's writing is not to dismiss the power gifts. It's just to say that's not all there is. There are all kinds of spiritual gifts, and that's the emphasis of Paul's uh, teaching here. Uh, but underneath the category of the power gifts are these things like prophecy, and that's not the prophecy as a spiritual gift is not about the future. Like we think of that word prophecy, it's actually about speaking the word of God and power in the present in a way that motivates people into action. Um, the gift of tongues, which is one of the controversies that was arising in the church that he is addressing, and that would be a whole entire separate sermon in order to get into all of that interpretation of tongues, intercession, or praying for others, the gift of faith, the gift of discernment words of knowledge, gifts of healing, uh, and, and, mir and the miraculous miracles. And I would just say here um, that we believe, I believe as your pastor, we believe as a church in, in all the gifts, that all the gifts of the Spirit, the biblical gifts are available and are vital to the mission of the church and are to be earnestly desired and practiced. That we are, that we do not, technically we're not cessationists is the theological category. We're not cessationists. We don't believe that a certain number of the gifts, particularly the miraculous gifts, are like for just the apostles. And that when the canon of scripture was completed, that it was like, okay, we're going to shut that faucet off. And those kinds of things, like prayers for healing and those types of things just don't happen today. And that is, that's important, you know, for us to, to at least know, okay, this is, this is what we believe, that we believe that the Holy Spirit is powerful and real and miracles still happen today. Um, but let's just be honest, it's also kind of weird. It can, it can be, it can be, uh, it can be spooky if, if, if we're really honest at times. And I think that's mainly because um, there's the counterfeit out there, isn't there? There's, so, there's examples of those that have, uh, that have been uh, fanatical and sensationalistic as it relates to things like healing is, a believe, a, a beautiful spiritual gift to pray for healing. But then you have like televangelists, self-proclaimed faith healers, 
that have given that whole idea a real, a real black eye. And so, but here's what I'd ask you. How do, we, how do you know that there's such a thing as a, how, how would you be trained to identify a counterfeit bill? You know, someone is trained to identify a counterfeit bill by becoming very intimately and intricately knowledgeable of the real article. Know what the real thing looks like so you can identify the counterfeit, right? Every time there's a counterfeit of anything, it's because there's something authentic that, is, is, that it's contrasted to. And so I would just say the, about the power gifts, and that's part of what the Apostle Paul would say about spiritual gifts, I do not want you to be ignorant. I do not want you to be uninformed. Uh, that this possibility that the Holy Spirit can work in power and desires to work in power in and through us and in and through his church um, is something we don't need to, th because of the counterfeits out there, allow that to keep us from the authentic that God would have for us. And so I want to say that there's certain traps to be, that we should avoid as we prepare to close today. The traps are related to spiritual gifts that I think are important for us to avoid are one comparison, and that's what Paul is addressing here. And that is to look at someone's gifts and say, well, they're really get, their gift is more important than my gift. Paul's whole approach to this letter is like, don't do this. In fact, in this, in this very letter, he, you talked about comparisons are odious. Comparisons are not, are not, it's not God's will for us to compare ourselves to one another unfavorably or favorably. You know, and to say, I'm better than you or I'm not as good as you uh, related to the spiritual gifts. That it actually cuts against the whole entire purpose of the gifts. The purpose of the gifts are so that we're better. You know, it's like on a basketball team, you got point guards, right? And then you got the big man down low. And if every person on a basketball team is seven feet tall, it's probably not going to be a very good basketball team. But if everybody on a basketball team is just 5'11", probably not going to be a very good basketball team. Because we need each other. We're better together. And so no one should ever say, well, you know, I wish I was as tall as you. I wish I was. We need to look at one another's and value one another's gifts. So comparison is a trap. Projection is a trap. Projection is, is, is when I think I have a certain gift and then I think other people ought to think the way I think or, or work the way I work um, because it, I come from that position. It's my vantage point. If you have the gift of administration, you know, and then you're, you're in a team and some people don't have the gift of administration, right? It's so easy to just think, why, 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 are the, why, why do they operate the way, why can't they do things, why can't they be on time, you know, why can't they get their work in, you know, in, a, in an orderly, and I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not condoning irresponsibility, but I'm just saying we're different, right? And we, if we really understand and value one another's gifts, then we're, we, we will resist the tendency to project the gift that we have on others. And then one of the things I think is important, the final trap, is the trap of of what, what kind of excuse the dismissal of responsibility that can sometimes come with our understanding of spiritual gifts. It's a beautiful thing to discover and deploy your spiritual gifts, but sometimes there's a little bit of a shadow side of, of knowing what our gifts are. And that is we can think that, that there's a whole other 99% of what it means to follow Jesus that we could, that we could say, I don't, well, I don't have to do that anymore. Like, you, for instance, the gift of mercy. There's a spiritual gift of mercy. And it's easy if we, as far as caring for the poor, for someone to say, oh, boy, I'm glad people have that gift. Uh, you know, I just don't have that gift, right? I don't have the spiritual gift of mercy. And so I'm just going to be kind of a, you know, all about the truth and, you know, doing Bible study or whatever. I don't have the gift of mercy. That's for other people that have that gift. And that, I've seen that play out time and time again. I've seen myself tempted in that way time and again. There's, not having the spiritual gift of mercy is not an excuse for not showing mercy. 
those are kind of two different. How about the gift of giving? There's a spiritual gift of giving. I know, I've known people that have that spiritual gift of generosity. That is their primary gifting. And man, it's a, it's an awesome thing when people discover that God has given them the ability to really make money and they love having resources and then investing those resources in kingdom purposes. It's amazing when that gifting has happened. But we can't say, well, I don't have the gift of giving. So, I, you know, I don't have to give. Faith. My wife has the spiritual gift of faith. Kathy has the gift of faith. I have the gift of doubt. It's just like, you know, it's, it's like she just, she believes. When she prays, she believes. And, and she, this is the reason she's such an effective prayer warrior and intercessor is because she has this spiritual gift of faith. She just believes it. And I have to fight, you know, my Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. But because I don't have the spiritual gift of faith like she has doesn't mean that, that I'm not called to have faith. I still have to lean into having faith as a part of my Christian walk, developing faith at part of our mission, even if I don't have the spiritual gift. So I hope you kind of get the point of that, is that what Paul's teaching us is that we, we each have different gifts, and that we need to understand that the gifts that God has given us are given for the greater good. So I'm going to close now, but I want to close with this, this idea of how we're all part of something bigger. And one of my favorite movies is The Dead Poet Society with Robin Williams. You may remember that movie. Very powerful movie. It's kind of known primarily for the line, Carpe Diem, Seize the Day. Um, he plays this teacher, Mr. Keating, at this boys' school, and, and he's, in, he's this English teacher, and he actually inspires these, these young men to, to love poetry and to love literature and to also kind of live while you're living life. And this is not coming from any kind of Christian perspective, but he quotes this poem from Walt Whitman in, as, in this kind of dramatic point of the film and, and they, he has them all on kind of the edge of their seats as he recites this poem. And the Walt Whitman poem go, goes like this, O oh me, O oh life, of the questions of those recurring, of the endless trains of the faithless, of cities filled with the foolish, of myself forever reproaching myself for who more foolish than I or who, and who more faithless, of eyes that vainly crave the light, of the object's mean, of the struggle ever renewed, of the poor results of all, of the plotting and sordid crowds I see around me, of the em empty and useless years of the rest, with the rest me intertwined. The question, oh me, so sad recurring, what good amid these, oh me, oh life? Basically, what, what's the point of it all, you know? Are we just kind of random, aimless beings like Solomon of old wrote in Ecclesiastes? Why are we even here? And then he says the answer, that you are here, that life exists and identity, that the powerful play goes on and you may contribute a verse. I would add, if it, from my Christian perspective, I might change that word or add to the word the idea of identity with what we have as persons of faith, eternity. That you are here, that life exists in eternity. And that a power, the powerful plate goes on and you may contribute a verse. And then Keating looked at those boys and said, what will your verse be? What will your verse be? When we discover and deploy our spiritual gifts, we experience the joy that comes from glorifying God, from serving others, fulfilling our purpose, and making ripples for eternity. Because what we do is not only about the here and now, it is about an eternal difference that we together can make. And from the most obvious and visible parts, like the part that I'm privileged and called to do right here, doing my best to use the gifts that God has given me that I discovered over time. How did I discover it? By experimentation. Somebody said, we need a teacher. 
would you teach? And I said, oh, no, I'll try. And then something kind of clicked, right? Through experimentation, I'm like, maybe I'm, maybe I should do more of this. And as I did more of this, I thought, maybe I'm called to preach. And so when we just answer an invitation and we say, I'll help, we might discover what our gift is not. But we have the opportunity to discover what our gift is and then grow it and grow in it by God's help. Ephesians 2.10, one of my favorite verses said, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. And I was meditating on that verse that this week as I put it in the conclusion of the message. And what jumped off the page to me this time was the words, we and us. We, not me. Us, not I. Together, we can make a contribution that will make ripples through eternity in every part matters. Let's pray. God, we... uh, thank you for your Holy Spirit. We thank you for the gifts, but most more, we thank you for the giver, uh, that we uh, are blessed to experience the winds of your spirit, and through that, uh, your grace, your forgiveness, your redemption, your salvation, but more than that, a purpose and a calling that you have given every single one of us. We're all gifted if we are new. And we're all called to be a part of what you're doing inside and outside your church. Uh, Lord, uh, lead us and guide us as we discover and deploy those gifts as a family. One body, many gifts, one Lord, one calling. Help us, Lord, to lean into that more intentionally and fully. We pray in Jesus' name. We're going to close with one uh, final song, and our invitation this morning is twofold. I would invite you to please take this card that you were given, the Activate card, um, and I would just challenge every single person in this room to consider uh, filling this out and turning it in. Um, We're actually going to do that together as a family up front, so think of it as like we're taking communion, right? We're We're each going to come up and not take but give and offer our consecration to him there's a place on there that says I'm already serving (laughs) so if you're serving that's awesome Uh, maybe God might be leading you to consider you know uh, additional open doors of opportunity but for some of you it's maybe time to, to get in the game you know just take a step take a risk and our team would love to help you you know find your place um so no no, uh, no commitment. It just starts a conversation. It could lead to a commitment, right? And so that's all we're asking. So you'd either put, yes, I'm interested, I'm not ready yet, or I'm currently serving on the crew on the back, and give us a name and a contact. And then as we uh, sing this cl- song, if you would just offer that up um, in one of these baskets up front, that would be a great way just for us all to consecrate ourselves before the Lord today. And then we also will have prayer partners on the sides. And so uh, if you just have a prayer need or after you place your card, if you just want us to pray over you uh, about this, what we're talking about today or any other need that you might have, uh, through these prayer times, we operate in the gifts of the Spirit, right? Uh, Gifts of prayer, gifts of of mercy and gifts of encouragement and gifts of healing. Um, And so we would love the opportunity to pray over you as we all stand and sing and worship together. that out and you stay seated but if you're ready to stand would you sing with me today in the crushing in the pressing you are making new wine in the soil I surrender you are breaking 
chosen to put your spirit into us, to call us into action. You don't do that and then leave us, but you fill us. And so we come to you with open hands, Lord, knowing that we are vessels of your spirit in this world. Would you use us to bring your kingdom here on earth? We lay down all of the old things and from this point forward, Lord, look forward to the way that you are going to be moving and active in our lives. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for worshiping God with us. We look forward to seeing you again next week. We pray I have prayer partners at the front as always. Have a great week. Part of living in the power of the Holy Spirit involves using our spiritual gifts as God directs. Now, we all operate in different areas of giftedness. We are all gifted and called. Specifically here at Cove, there's a need for small group leaders and teachers, ushers, nursery workers, coffee servers, etc. whether you feel gifted or not. And if you don't know what gift you have, start by volunteering in something of interest, and eventually you're going to discover it. Consider signing up for the crew on our website at covechurch.com and see what gifts God has given you. We look forward to serving with you. Have a great week, everyone.